Web applications need to run fast. Whenever I meet web developers out there uh, who have just finished the application or are starting a new one, one question that comes over and over again is, how do I make my web application run fast? They keep on saying that, okay, their site doesn't run fast or it's too slow. Many a times, this means that your relational database needs help. So in the figure shown uh, in the slide, you can see that we have an application tier sending a bunch of requests to the relational database tier in the back end. So these are read and write requests. And many times, the relational database on the back end can get overwhelmed with too many requests sent by the application layer. And so you add a cache. A cache can be used to kind of spread the load and uh, shed some of the load that you send to the RDBMS layer at the back end. So uh, as you can see in the figure, you have the application, which is uh, sending read requests, say, to the memcached layer, and write requests go to the relational database tier. But still, uh, that's still not enough, and you still have problems. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about some of the, these problems associated with memcached. I will later introduce Couchbase Server, the, a NoSQL database which can be used to solve some of these problems and challenges. We will also look at some of the technical considerations you need to think about when using Couchbase Server and also how Couchbase Server can be deployed to replace memcached. Finally, uh, uh, we will have uh, a talk by Kendall who will talk about how Couchbase Server is used at his company, AMA and Hobbies, and we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. So uh, a lot of you might be familiar with this uh, architecture diagram. So uh, this architecture diagram shows a bunch of users so, uh, using a browser and then sending these requests to the application layer. So the application layer uh, sends read and write requests uh, to the memcached nodes, as well as could, uh, in terms of cache misses or specific write requests, send them to the RDBMS layer. So this is a, a typical uh, memcached uh, uh, setup which you might be familiar with. With that, let us look at some of uh, the challenges uh, that you might be faced with memcached. The first one is cold cache. So imagine you have an application uh, layer, you have individual memcached nodes, and you have the RDBMS layer at the back end. And the application sends a request uh, to the memcached node, in, in this case, uh, trying to fetch an item D. And since D uh, already exists uh, in the memcached node, you get the reply back to the application. And that's all fair and good. Uh, similarly, uh, you have another request sent send by the application layer to the memcached nodes for another item. And you get the response back. But imagine what happens if uh, this memcached node crashes or has to be taken offline due to some maintenance. In this case, all the requests are sent to the backend RDBMS layer, and that could ca cause contention in the RDBMS layer, in the backend. So when the mem uh, memcached node comes back online, uh, it, it does not have anything in it, and it's uh, fresh and cold. And hence, uh, even at this point, all the requests go through the memcache the, uh, node to the backend. So th a lot of times, the backends uh, slow down, or this kind of pattern can collapse the RDBMS layer in the backend. Uh, let's, let's look at another challenge faced with memcached, now in terms of scalability. So imagine you have the same setup. You have a bunch of applications. You have a bunch of uh, individual memcached nodes and an RDBMS layer at the backend. And uh, a new memcached node uh, comes online. Uh, note that to bring a new memcached node online uh, is uh, pretty challenging. It uh, requires a lot of setup and install scripts to bring this memcached node online, as well as the application has to be aware that this now memcached node is now online. So imagine this memcached node comes online and the application starts using this memcached node. In this case, uh, D was originally not in the memcached node and it had to fetch the item D from the backend layer into the memcached node. Note that in this case, you have duplicate information. Uh, the item D uh, is available is in two memcached nodes, and you need to explicitly warm up the memcached nodes, as we, uh, as we saw, uh, saw in, uh, in this animation. The another... Uh, Another example uh, where uh, it's challenging is if the cache is partitioned. So 
So imagine you have an equipartition cache, right? And uh, a new node is bought online. And now when uh, the application uh, needs to fetch uh, new data into this new cache node, you would have to invalidate the entire cache so that uh, the new partitioning scheme uh, is uh, understood by the application. So you'll have to pretty much invalidate all the three first cache nodes in order to rebuild the entire cache and equipartition it again. Memcached is also complex to monitor. Um, since Memcached consists of individual nodes, uh, management has to be done per node. There is a lack of consistent view of the caching tier. If you go online, you'll, have a, you, you'll find a bunch of different scripts, and there's no consistent view to get uh, to, uh, so that you can monitor the entire Memcached uh, tier. So now let's talk about Couchbase Server, and let's uh, look at how Couchbase Server solves some of these Memcached challenges that we just saw. So what is Couchbase Server? So Couchbase Server is a NoSQL uh, database. It, it, it provides easy scalability, consistent high performance, and always on availability. So what do we mean by that, right? So uh, by easy scalability, uh, Couchbase enables you to add new nodes to the Couchbase cluster uh, as simple as through the click of a button. So uh, if you go to our admin console, for example, you can just click a button to add a new node, and boom, you get a new node added uh, to your Couchbase cluster. And all, this all can be done while the application is still online, and you can scale without any changes to your application. Uh, Couchbase server, when you bring a new node online, also provides auto sharding. So your data uh, with, within each of the Couchbase nodes is automatically partitioned um, uh, as well as automatically distributed to the different Couchbase server nodes so, so that you have a good balance of uh, I, uh, good spread of I.O. Uh, and load across the Couchbase uh, server cluster. Uh, the next thing is about high performance. So Couchbase has an in-memory uh, object managed cache. And because of this in-memory object managed cache, as we will see in the next few slides, you, you get consistent sub-millisecond response time. Uh, definitely, since cache is much more, uh, the keeping data items in cache is much more faster than keeping data items on disk. Uh, you also get high throughput, which means that you need now fewer servers, uh, fewer Couchbase nodes to service your growing number of users. But now you may ask, like, what does it mean to uh, you know, add a new node uh, to a running Couchbase cluster? And I said, as I said earlier, with the easy scalability, you can add this uh, new node to your Couchbase server cluster all while your application is online. The next thing is about always, avail always on availability. So Couchbase Server provides uh, replication where, you, uh, where data is replicated to different Couchbase Server nodes. And, provides, and this provides high availability uh, of your data. Uh, uh, in addition to that, Couchbase Server also provides uh, online operations, for example, backup and restore, which can be done online without any downtime to your application. So Couchbase Server is a perfect uh, memcached tier replacement use case. And let me explain why that is. Right. So at a high level, Couchbase Server is fully memcached protocol compliant. So this means that it can be used as a drop-in replacement for your memcached uh, layer without any application rewrite. Frequently accessed items are kept in memory. And uh, because of that, you get ultra low latencies for read and write operations. Data is also automatically sharded and distributed and replicated across the cluster nodes. Uh, you also get uh, to enjoy the scalability and high availability advantages that you don't get, uh, you don't see with memcached. Uh, monitoring, monitoring is also easy because uh, Couchbase Server provides an admin dashboard which gives you a centralized, uh, unified monitoring tool across your Couchbase Server cluster. So that's really cool. So this is how you, what will happen if you replace a, couch, uh, a memcached server tier with Couchbase server. So you'll have pretty much the same architecture setup. You have a bunch of uh, front-end users sending requests uh, to, the, uh, to the application layer, which then talks to the back-end Couchbase server nodes uh, to service these uh, caching requests. Note that the difference between the earlier diagram, which I showed earlier in the architecture, and this diagram is now with Couchbase server, you have a clustered solution uh, you have a bunch of nodes which have knowledge about each other. However, they are independent, but they have a, they, they're connected through replication, and they have knowledge about each other. So now uh, let us understand some of uh, 
the basic operations that Couchbase server provides. Right. Let's start uh, with the right operations. But before that, let me explain some of the uh, high-level internals of the Couchbase server node. So uh, each Couchbase server node uh, is identical. And uh, at a high level, they consist of three or four components. So in, as you can see in this figure, you have a managed cache, uh, which is uh, the component inside the Couchbase server node. You have a replication queue, which uh, holds data to be replicated to other Couchbase server nodes. You also have a disk queue which will uh, be used to persist data to disk. And this is all done asynchronously, as we will see uh, in this animation. So imagine you have a write operation. You have a document one that has to be written to Couchbase server. So your application server sends this document, and it gets added to the managed cache within Couchbase server. This document then gets added to the replication queue as well as the disk write queue. As you can see here, the, the the, the document one got replicated to the other, other Couchbase server node, and the item in the disk uh, queue was then asynchronously flushed to disk. Now imagine you have an update operation. So if you have um, a new update coming for document one, similar, this follows a similar pattern where you uh, write this document to the managed cache within the Couchbase server node. This document gets added to the replication, update gets added to the replication queue and the disk write queue. And then again, the disk write queue uh, gets flushed asynchronously to disk to replace the document. And uh, the replication queue document gets sent to the other replica nodes. Now let's look at a read operation. So in the case of a read operation, imagine uh, your application asks Couchbase server to give it document one. In this case, uh, since the document was in the managed cache, uh, it was serviced to the application straight out of the managed cache. Now imagine a case where you send a lot of documents to the managed cache. And now the managed cache becomes full. In this case, Couchbase server uh, will evict the item from the managed cache and flush it to the disk. What happens in the case of a cache miss? In the case of a cache miss, for example, if you have a set of items in the, in the managed cache, then you, uh, and you request for document one, this item is brought from the disk through the disk queue into the managed cache and then sent back to the application. So adding nodes, as I mentioned earlier, in Couchbase server is quite easy. So what happens is you have a, uh, you have a set of applications in the front end uh, which uh, use a smart client library typically to talk to the back end Couchbase server nodes. As you can see in the diagram, you have a bunch of, uh, you have three Couchbase server nodes with each having active and replica documents. And now imagine you add two more Couchbase server nodes, node four, node five. When you add these Couchbase server nodes and initiate a, uh, a rebalance, uh, data is moved uh, from these other, uh, from the other uh, previously uh, seen nodes to these new nodes, and uh, you get a good distribution of data uh, across the cluster. You can now see that the application can now talk to these new uh, added nodes as well. Now imagine a case where one of the nodes in Couchbase server fails. In this case, uh, replica documents from other nodes uh, are promoted to active documents, and the cluster map in uh, the client library of Couchbase server is updated to know about the new topology that, OK, this node has failed. And now you can see that the application now is aware through the, through the client library that these are the new set of active uh, nodes in Couchbase server. Couchbase Server also provides real-time traffic graphs, per bucket monitoring and stats, internode traffic graphs, um, RAM disk interplay graphs, etc. for monitoring. We also have a REST API that you can use uh, to integrate with other monitoring solutions in Couchbase. And how can you see all this? So this is all uh, available through the admin console in Couchbase Server. So if you log into Couchbase Server and use the admin console, you'll basically see that you'll be able to see all these statistics uh, statistics and graphs, uh, and, it's real, and it provides you a drill down analysis uh, to do some of your monitoring. Okay, so it works. Um, some of uh, why it is a good uh, use case to replace Memcached. Let us now look at some of the deployment options uh, of how you can deploy Couchbase Server and how it can be used to deploy, uh, you can deploy it to replace Memcached. So on the left, I have a Memcached kind of client and application layer. Uh, and uh, on the right, I have Couchbase server. So what happens there is um, once 
let's look at uh, let's read this diagram from right to left where we look at a, a state where we have no application changes at all. So if you have if you need no application changes, then all you can do is use the embedded uh, Couchbase server proxy available in Couchbase server, and uh, the, using that you can just directly uh, take your app and then connect it uh, through through Couchbase uh, to use the proxy embedded proxy in Couchbase server. The second thing is uh, by say using the standalone proxy. So by using the standalone proxy, what you can do is you can install the standalone proxy as you can see on uh, all the cli uh, clients. And then once you do that, you can then talk to the Couchbase server directly. Uh, the minimal change option is basically using a native smart client. So what in this case, what you do is you install a native smart client on your, with your application and then use the native start client to talk to the Couchbase server node. So next, let's look at some of the technical considerations you have to consider when using Couchbase server. So uh, the first thing is uh, ejection instead of eviction. So in this case, uh, as you saw in the diagram earlier, right, in, in the case of memcached, uh, there is, uh, if you lose, if one of the node goes down, you basically lose the data. Uh, similarly, if an item gets evicted from memcached, you basically lost that particular data and it's no longer in the memcached node. In the case of Couchbase server, uh, data is never deleted unless, unless the client deletes the document from the database or using an expiration TTL, value for the doc. Right? So instead, uh, the ejection process actually removes the item from the RAM in Couchbase server and adds a copy uh, to disk. The second thing is about increased disk and I.O. So as we saw earlier that Couchbase server provides replication and provides some kind of persistence for your document. Uh, you need, a, you, you, we have an increased disk and network I.O. requirements compared to memcached. Right? Uh, the other thing is about memory pressure and bulk loading. So in this case, uh, imagine that you suddenly have a, a scenario where you have memory pressure, right? Uh, when you have memory pressure, what Couchbase server does is Couchbase server tries to control the incoming queue as well as the queue that is getting written to disk asynchronously. And uh, you might have temporarily intermittent um, out of memory uh, error messages while you're doing bulk loading due to this scenario in Couchbase server. And typically the application would retry after using uh, some kind of backup factor. The next is about sizing changes. So with sizing changes, uh, you know, you, we need to provide, you need to provide the benefits of auto sharding, replication, and persistence. And because Couchbase server needs to provide those benefits, we need extra metadata to be associated with each data item that is stored in Couchbase server. And this could, re uh, uh, this could result in uh, requiring you to size your RAM according, uh, appropriately to your workload. So uh, in the later, in the, in the next few slides, I'll provide some links which you can go and look at some online documentation and see how you could come up with a good size, uh, what is a good sizing uh, um, formula you can use to basically size your Couchbase server node. The next thing is about database warm-up. So uh, as, as you saw, right, so Couchbase server initially, when it starts up, if you have no data in Couchbase server, Couchbase server uh, creates the data files and starts servicing the load. But there could be cases that you have data in Couchbase server, and when you bring a Couchbase server node up uh, online, you will have to read this data from disk and warm up uh, this Couchbase server node. And this warm up is done by Couchbase server before the traffic uh, start, it starts servicing traffic, front end traffic. Uh, I'll now like to pass it to uh, Kendall Bennett, uh, who will talk about how Couchbase is used at his company, A Main Hobbies. Kendall? Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Kendall Bennett, and uh, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Amen Hobbies, and we're a leading online internet retailer of ready control cars, trucks, helicopters, and airplanes. Um, basically, uh, big boys' toys, I suppose. Uh, I'm a computer programmer with over 20 years of experience myself, having run a computer software company in the past. So I was going to talk today about uh, how we use Couchbase on our website and uh, how our old system worked and what we did to, to replace it. So previously, uh, the prior solution that we had was based on um, the Windows file system. So, uh, what happened here? 
Uh, anyway, uh, so let me get back to this one here. I lost my slide here. Um, the database server that we have right now runs on Linux using MySQL, but our application server itself actually runs on Windows and is using a combination of PHP code compiled with a tool called Ballinger and ASP.NET code uh, MVC written in C Sharp. Um, so the entire application stack basically runs on .NET on Windows, and the database stack runs on MySQL. And we have Couchbase running on the same server as our MySQL server. And uh, the caching solution we did before was done using the Windows file system, and we would cache result sets from the SQL server as well as uh, HTML fragments from uh, creating pages to disk, which was used to load, uh, speed up the page load times. And the, the system worked, but the performance wasn't that great. So we started looking around at what the issues were, and investigating the performance problems, we then indicated that a lot of time was actually spent managing the files. And one of the things we've discovered over years is that the Windows file system is quite slow compared to, say, uh, the Unix file system or Linux. And as the cache would fill up with thousands of files, the file system got a lot slower and slower. Sometimes it would actually take literally 30 minutes to delete the old cache files if we had to flush the cache after a major site upgrade. So we ended up having to write a script that would rename the directory so we could get the, the new site up and running really quickly. And then in the background, we delete all those files that were hanging around. And uh, initially, we thought, well, maybe the problem is it's really a disk. So we tried moving it to a RAM disk on Windows. And it, it actually only made it marginally faster. It didn't really fix the problem we had. So one of the issues we have is that we need to be able to invalidate cache entries pretty quickly because we will cache things on our front end products pages like uh, category information and stuff like that. And if somebody on the back end is making changes, we need that to go live in a relatively short period of time. So um, ideally, we'd like to cache some things for a long period of time, but delete them on demand when we know somebody actually changed it. And that's where we're running into a lot of problems with deleting it, not to mention the system would actually get slow as the file system filled up with files. So we started looking around, and we looked at uh, memcached, but we couldn't actually find any good uh, memcached service for Windows because our primary development is done on Windows. So in the search for a memcached client, we came across Couchbase and uh, decided to get a, a commercial contract with them and have been very happy with the results. And initially, we just did a simple replacement for the file system cache with no new features using memcached buckets. And once we did that, we deployed it live and immediately noticed um, significant performance improvements on the website. And once we had a good caching solution, we were then able to spend time improving our caching solution to improve what we cached and cache more items on the website to get even more performance. So one of the things that we wanted to do, like I described, described before, was the ability to invalidate large chunks of the cache quickly when things like a product category gets edited. And previously with the file system, we would have to track all those files and then delete them all. So the initial solution we did was to track the entries in a list, which was uh, kind of similar to how we do the file system. Instead of having a directory that contains the files, we would create a list in Couchbase that listed all of the cache entries that were related to that particular group of entries we wanted to invalidate. And then when we came along to invalidate it, we grab the list and go ahead and enumerate over all the items in the list and evict them from the cache. So the catch with that is that there's quite a bit of overhead involved in managing the lists of items themselves. So if you've got thousands of items in the cache, then that list gets quite big. So every time you write something to the cache, there's more and more overhead to maintain that list. And evicting it is not a, an, a, uh, an instant solution either. So when you evict something from the cache, you have to go through all those items. And while that's happening, new items could be entering the cache at the same time. So what we did is we came up with a solution of Sentinels and essentially flipped everything around and said, let's not track what things are in a group. Let's track what groups that a particular item lives in. And by doing that, we can just track the small group of items that something is dependent on with the item itself. And the write solution becomes much faster. So writing to the cache is extremely fast. We don't have to do anything different. We don't have to actually track anything. When we read from the cache, we have to check a small list of sentinels, which is the list of items this thing depends upon to see if anything has changed. And those sentinels are really just a single object that contains a number. And once we decide that we want to invalidate that particular group, all we need to do is use the very fast couch-based increment operation to increment that to a new number. And then next time somebody tries to read from the cache, they're going to read the sentinel values and compare it against the previous sentinel values that were there when the item was last read and say, oh, they've changed. Therefore, the cache is invalidated. So by using that solution, um, and I'll show you the interface in a second here, uh, by using that solution, 
we are able to actually create something that we can track things very, very efficiently in the cache. And more importantly, when we want to invalidate it, it's just one very, very quick call to cache base, and instantly we can invalidate 10,000 items from the cache, and they're, they're gone. Well, actually, they're not really gone. They're still in the cache, but we just consider them invalid so we don't actually use them again. So on the next slide, I have the, uh, uh, the interface that we created. So you can see it's pretty simple. The write operation is pretty simple. It takes an object, um, takes the group, which is really um, the main key that it lives in. And we use that to organize the names of the keys as well so that they're distinct. Uh, the key for the item was sticking into the, the cache and the date that it expires at, which is optional. If you don't pass in the date, it will be considered something that's uh, valid forever. And it will stay there until somebody either evicts it from the cache or there's memory pressure on the cache and it gets evicted by cache base itself. Um, the read operation takes in an object, a group of key, and also an optional list of extra dependencies. So every object is always dependent on one particular group, and then you can also list other dependencies in there that will be invalidated as well. And the last one, obviously, is invalidate cache and then get cache sentinel. We have that for information so we can effectively see when something has actually changed on our website. So that's how we did our main caching implementation. The next thing we also did, once we had that up and running on our website, was to look around and say, what other things can we stick in Couchbase? And the first thing that came to mind was to put our session data in Couchbase as opposed to putting it into our MySQL server. And um, the, the intention there is to actually improve the performance somewhat because we can take more, uh, take some of the pressure off our MySQL server and move the session data into Couchbase because it's getting hit constantly by the pages, obviously, when people are browsing around and doing things, adding things to the shopping cart or whatever, the session's getting hit. So by using Couchbase, we're able to speed that up by storing them in persistent Couchbase buckets so that uh, if Couchbase goes down, the information is never lost. And if there's memory pressure on Couchbase, we still don't lose the data. It's always there rather than using a memcached bucket. And the performance has been excellent. And one of the most important things for me is security. And by having the data stored in Couchbase, there's no way in Couchbase for a hacker who might get into my system, and we all know they're out there, and if they did get into my system, they can't actually read that session data, which is really important because there's no way of them saying, list all the items in the Couchbase store um, that are related to this particular session data. Whereas with MySQL, they could. So if they got in, they could certainly steal our session data, and there could be important information there. If a customer is in the middle of a checkout process, it could contain their address, it could contain credit card information or something. So uh, in, like in a temporary uh, state. So it's important that security is much better that way. That was one of the reasons we did it. Um, so we did that, and the next thing we also did was look around and say, what else can we put in the cache? And we wanted to use an output cache effectively. So the way the output cache works, if anyone's familiar with ASP.NET, is that they have a great output cache system already. And it allows you to uh, cache pages or fragments of pages in their cache system. So we basically built a plugin for the Apple Cache Provider, which is now available on the uh, on the internet, that will allow you to plug that in and store the Apple Cache in Couchbase as opposed to the regular stores that are provided by IS. Um, so we did that, and it actually worked really well. We ran into a couple of problems. I haven't written my blog about it yet, but I'll talk about it later. Um, and there's an there's quite an interesting scenario if you're trying to get the cache, the Apple Cache, to work across sessions with a, a browser. Sorry, with a uh, a spider because the spiders don't set sessions. And so every single page will actually try to set a session cookie to trigger the spider and the Apple cache doesn't work if you're trying to set a cookie. So unbeknownst to a lot of people out there, you have to find a solution to disable the sessions when you know a spider is looking, otherwise the Apple cache will never actually get used at all. Um, whether it's my Apple cache or uh, one that's provided by another solution. So uh, moving forward, we obviously want to look around at what other things can we do to move into Couchbase as opposed to out of MySQL. And our, our goal in the future is to effectively replace MySQL for the basic site data, such as our product pages, information pages, etc. A lot of the metadata that describes what's on the website and move those into a persistent NoSQL store using Couchbase, but still keep MySQL for our core transactional component for placing orders and managing inventory levels. Because that's an important area where we need to make sure we have uh, good consistency and asset compliance. But for the rest of it, just serving up pages when a customer is browsing around, that's a great situation where we could put more things into Couchbase. Um, and we need the ability to index data for this, so we're waiting around for Couchbase 2.0 to get released, which I hope is soon. 
and are pretty excited about what we can do to scale our website even more using that solution. Uh, that's about it for me. If you want more information, you can check out my blog. Um, and I have some blogs up already. I'll have some more in the coming weeks. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask. So uh, here are a few reference links that you might find useful. So this is the links to our web page, uh, more information about Memcached. There is also a white paper that's available that you guys can uh, go feel free to download and read, which is in a lot of detail. Uh, there is also uh, the Cisco performance benchmarks, uh, to, which talk about some of the latencies and throughput uh, numbers uh, achievable through Couchbase Server. The sizing guide, as I mentioned earlier, to kind of know how to size your RAM uh, when, when you kind of are looking at replacing Memcached with Couchbase. And if you have any questions, now is the time to ask in the chat. Uh, or you can also send an email to me. This is my email address at Couchbase. Uh, I should also remind you guys about the upcoming uh, CouchCon San Francisco conference, which is coming up on September 21st. Um, uh, there is, for all the attendees uh, on this webinar, uh, there is a free promo code you can use. It's called Webinar, and that will give you a 10% uh, discount to, for your tickets to CouchCon. So it'll be great. We have an awesome uh, set of speakers there uh, to learn about and that you can uh, hear about some of how they've used Couchbase and some of the environments. And uh, it's also a good uh, event for you guys to come and network and learn more about Couchbase. Uh, I now will open the floor up for any questions. I encourage uh, folks to online uh, to ask any kind of questions. So I think we have uh, two or three questions available at this point. So. So we have a question whether uh, if there's any way to import and export uh, uh, data from uh, Couchbase. And the answer is um, yes, there's the CB backup and CB restore tools that you can use with Couchbase server. And uh, that's how you can basically uh, export your data and re-import re it back into Couchbase server. And that all can be done while the server is running and it's online. So this, it provides online support for using some of these tools. Uh, another question is about: uh, Is there a, uh, what is the standalone pro uh, proxy uh, that was mentioned in the slide? And uh, you can the, the standalone proxy is the Moxie uh, uh, component, and that can be downloaded through. It's available through our website. So if you go to a download section at Couchbase.com/downloads, you'll be able to see. Uh, and if you go to all downloads, you'll be able to see some of the different. Uh, uh, proxies that you can download, as I mentioned uh, to you. Uh, the links are also available in the white paper. So if you look at the white papers, you can see some of the links uh, to download and uh, some of these components while you think about uh, migrating from uh, Memcached to Couchbase. Uh, the smart client. So the smart client. There was a question: Is what is the smart client? And uh, so the smart client, which was mentioned in the deploy in the deployment slide, was basically uh, talking about, it, it's basically the client which is topology aware. So um, if you go through Moxie, Moxie handles all the topology kind of uh, mappings that you would like uh, the Couchbase server would need. But if you don't go through the proxy layer, then you would have to install the smart client, which is a client that is topology aware and it knows about the the the, the, the bucket mappings uh, and the different kind, where the data resides in the back end. So that's, uh, that's what the smart client is. And the smart client uh, is uh, are available in different languages, Java, .NET, and so forth. And you can uh, get the smart client from our website. Um, I think this is a question for Kendall. Uh, Kendall, the question was, uh, when using Sentinel objects, how do you clean up your old keys or data over time? Uh, How do we clean up the old keys over data over time? Um, old key? I'm sorry. Was that, to, was that question to me? Yes. Uh, so the question was, again, uh, when using Sentinel objects, how do you clean up uh, the, the old keys and data over time? Right. And the, the key point about using the Sentinel objects is you use it for a cache system using Couchbase, I mean, sorry, using memcached buckets as opposed to a Couchbase bucket. 
So rather than actually um, worrying about evicting the items, they're eventually going to get evicted because either the expiration stamp on the item will get evicted, uh, will, will pass, or most likely it's going to get purged through the, uh, the fact that Couchbase is eventually going to need to evict it to get some memory space for something else. So it's a trade-off. You're not actually specifically evicting things from the cache, but Couchbase does a really good job of ca tracking things and deleting them when they've been hanging around too long anyway. Um, and so effectively we're trading that for the performance of being able to invalidate something pretty much instantly. Thanks, Kendall. Sure. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, is this Couchbase 2.0? So we're really excited about the Couchbase 2.0 release. Uh, but all that you see in this slide, uh, the slide deck especially for replacing um, uh, Memcached with Couchbase, is also uh, it's also pre 2.0. So uh, as uh, so as mentioned by Kendall at um, his company, they were uh, they are not yet using the 2.0 release. So this is all uh, you know replacing the use case of replacing Memcached with the Couchbase server is supported even pre 2.0. So there's another question, uh, Kendall, there's another question of uh, if you could uh, help describe what do you mean by the Sentinel object? The Sentinels themselves are actually objects in Couchbase. So in order to, to basically um, to keep track of the Sentinel, we, we store a, a single value in there. So they start out with a value of zero. We're actually, if there's nothing in the, in the Sentinel, we consider a value of zero. So we start with the first time we put one in there, it's going to be one. And we just increment it. So it's a number that's stored in there, and we can increment it using the uh, Couchbase increment atomic operation. Um, so that's what I mean when I say it's a sentinel object. It's really just another item that's stored in the cache that's used to, to invalidate um, a group or set of items that are also in the cache. Like a so, uh, so another thing uh, that I'd like to mention is uh, with the Couchbase buckets as to, you know, uh, to, uh, to use this kind of sentinel kind of uh, pattern, right, you could, uh, uh, you, you just have to set the expiration time on the object uh, uh, within, like in Couchbase using the Couchbase buckets and that will uh, be really helpful and it will act like a sentinel because after this expiration time, uh, these, bucket, uh, these objects are then uh, uh, sent to, this are not available at, in RAM anymore. Yeah, right. I mean, we have some items that we actually keep around indefinitely, and uh, those are something that maybe if you're using a Couchbase bucket, um, you wouldn't want to use that for something that was set once maybe and, and not really touched for a while. But the items that we store in our Couchbase buckets, in our, uh, our, our cache buckets that um, we don't invalidate with an expiration stamp are things that get hit pretty much on every single page. So there was another question of uh, what determines server failure. So uh, the server failure in Couchbase uh, is determined through the heartbeat. So we have a, a server heartbeat to determine if the server is up and running and working perfectly. And uh, uh, if the server is just offline for a moment, it could miss the heartbeat. And then if it starts up again, it, the heartbeats will be available again. So um, there are protocols which basically figure out the server is uh, it, it, has it failed or is, uh, has it failed or could be offline. And then when it comes online, it basically when you start uh, redistributing, it starts uh, getting the new data because of auto sharding and it starts getting uh, servicing load again. So. Um, Kendall, uh, one more question. Uh, what is the hardware configuration in terms of CPU and RAM uh, that you're using at uh, A Main Hobbies? Could you just, uh, shed some light on that? Sure. We actually have uh, the main web server is a, uh, let's see, I think it's a six core machine uh, with 12 gigabytes of memory that runs on Windows. And we're actually moving that to some uh, load balanced. Um, cloud servers with Rackspace, and the database server is actually a 12-core machine that has 48 gigabytes of memory on it, and that's the one that runs our MySQL database and our Couchbase um, 
But as an interesting aside, the reason why it, it sounds like that database server is pretty high end, and it's it is really high end. And one of the reasons why is we ran into a lot of performance problems with MySQL, and we're trying to figure out how to scale our website, and ended up scaling it by trying to scale the hardware, and then discovered that there was other fundamental problems with our database. Um, once we solved those problems and we started using Couchbase, our database server basically uses, I would say, never more than 10% CPU. <laughs> um, so there's another question about the latency and throughput numbers. That are, what are the throughput numbers uh, achievable through Couchbase server? And uh, to answer that question, I uh, have a few slides. Again, this, these are from the Cisco benchmark uh, that I kind of talked about earlier. So uh, as you can see in this slide, right, so you have a bunch of uh, objects of different sizes represented in the, on the x-axis and on the y-axis you can see some of the latency numbers again in microseconds uh, that is achievable through Couchbase server and if you can uh, pay a close attention to the red line here you can you get consistent low latencies even with varying dock sizes and uh, you know with a, with, a, with a mixed workload and this is as low as you know lower than 200 microseconds uh, with varying dock sizes so that is uh, a great experience that you'll see with using Couchbase server. Uh, the other thing is about, you know, how does it scale? So this goes into, you know, as you add more uh, servers into the Couchbase server cluster, what are the operations per second that you see, right? And and you can see that the line is fairly straight here, which means that we uh, we scale, we, we uh, there's a linear throughput scalability achieved uh, the, that you can get with Couchbase server, and it grows as you add uh, linearly, as you add more nodes in the Couchbase server cluster. Uh, Kendall, we have one other uh, really important question here from the audience. Uh, uh, somebody was asking, uh, what's your favorite uh, of all the, uh, the RC toys that you get to play with? <laughs> um, I'm actually a car guy. I've always been a, I've been a big racer for a long time. And uh, my favorite right now is my Kyosho Inferno MP9 Team Kyosho National 3 kit that I race. But I also have favorite helicopters too. I really like the Blade 130X helicopter, the micro helicopter. That thing's pretty amazing. Great. Well, maybe after the webinar, we can get a link to your uh, uh, to your site, and we'll send it out as well, so people can see what your favorite helicopter looks like. Sure. So, um, if there are no more questions, um, I would like to thank you all at this point for participating in this webinar. And uh, I hope you learned something and uh, you would consider Couchbase uh, to replace your Memcache DE tier. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, we will send a link out to the recording as well as the slides uh, shortly. Have a good day.